This looks good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Do I need the microphone? I could try it. Yeah. Just wander around. You, you just take it. You could also just talk here. Yeah. We could just do it from here, too. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Do we have a like SAM moderator person yeah. here, too? Or is it just wander, we'll wing it? Wander away. It's that time of the day. We're just going to go go wild. Um, I like it. Thank you for being here and for you know, at 5 o'clock still having neurons left to give attention to uh, any talk, but hopefully uh, this will be a fun one. Obviously lots of ooh, slide advancement too. Um, I'll probably just stand by this podium for now, but um, thanks for coming to this didactic. Uh, we called Enhancing Emergency Care Through Artificial Intelligence from Innovation to Implementation. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about a spectrum of elements of how to implement AI solutions in your ED and take a little bit of a theoretical approach and an actual implementation approach. Um, before we do that, we just want to say that we have no uh, disclosures to report related to the content in this um, presentation. The outline is going to be a little bit of the current paradigm and how we got here. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit. Um, since this is a joint innovation and informatics uh, interest groups presentation. We'll talk a little bit about the innovative spirit and how to approach problems in your ED from an innovation mindset. We'll get into the technical elements of uh, implementation, which Dev will uh, lead us through fearlessly, and then into accountability and quality improvement with uh, John. So this should be, should be fun. Um, so, unless, obviously, people are here because they're interested, and unless you've been, like, living under a rock for the last six months since the release of uh, GPT, um, artificial intelligence in medicine is very exciting, um, and it's probably coming for you to take your job um, or to, like, make your life maybe great or maybe horrible. I'm not really sure. Anywhere in between. Um, there's obviously many benefits to be realized in medical care, from automating um, image uh, evaluations to remote monitoring of patients. There's really no shortage of potential problems to solve um, and you know, ways to go about it. But let's just take, in, take a step back and think, where are we in the artificial intelligence space, and how is that different than machine learning or deep learning? Um, this is just a very chill diagram that makes its way around the internet all the time, where artificial intelligence is the bigger basket term for understanding and knowledge through information systems and prediction. Machine learning is a specific process that, again, Dev does a lot of work on, and deep learning is a subset of machine learning um, that has specific interest in uh, visual images and analyses and neural networks um, and things like that. Um, for those of you that think that this is like brand new, obviously, this is uh, Ed Feigenbaum, who was an AI researcher um, and was called like the father of expert systems. People have been working on AI and medicine for decades, um, at least since the 1960s, um, helping people understand best practices and best uh, pathways for our patients and even you know, just any recommender systems is not new. So, what happened and why are we talking about it so much in the last couple of years? Um, generally, I like to think then in like the Gartner hype cycle um, viewpoint, where in the 60s you had the beginning of this compute computational systems and people immediately started approaching that or adding it to uh, medical care, like we said, in expert systems. Um, you then had a, a first AI winter in medicine in the 70s. Then you had additional research coming out of more knowledge engineering, um, that guy Feigenbaum that we were just talking about, these additional um, expert systems. And then not much talk, at least when I was starting in medical school, AI was a discussion in the informatics world, but it wasn't really uh, something actionable yet. We were still just talking about clinical decision support systems and how to like enact um, alerts to annoy physicians to make uh, changes. So now we see our, we find ourselves like way off on the right here where we have a lot of hype on all of these things. AI for social good, um, deep learning, autonomous vehicles, people, tons of people in this room sure are already driving Teslas. Um, the world is our oyster. And why, why is that? Um, obviously there has been a massive boom, especially since the passage of the High Tech Act to the amount of data that we are recording. And you gotta do something with the data, right? You have to feed the machines. But we have more people than ever wearing wearable devices. I'm wearing one right now, my Garmin, Apple Watches. We have more and more data, and we kinda have to find something to do with it. Um, within that context, we then have all the various different um, foundational model development. And now 
the models are getting better. Again, Dev has written about this a little bit too, is the science of machine learning has gotten much better and more advanced even just in the last couple of years. Um, and so we're starting to be able to make use of all of the data that we've been collecting ambiently um, across the healthcare spectrum. But that still doesn't explain how we can use it or how anyone in the audience can actually use it in their emergency department. So with that, I'll pass it over to Larissa to talk a little bit about how you might think about and frame problems that might be useful for an AI or machine learning type of solution. Okay, plus I'm technically challenged, so I don't know why I'm, I'm involved in this talk, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about innovation, <laughs> more um, just to kind of think about how you might implement some of this in your emergency department. So we have this, um, example project. Um, so the project is uh, focused on designing and implementing an AI-based tool with the problem of boarding in the ED, right? So one of these big wicked problems. So how can AI help with that? Um, so some of the questions you'd want to think about are what are some of the challenges that you might face with this specific project? Um, how would you define the problem? And we're going to talk a little bit about problem-based thinking and um, user-centered design. And what data would you need to actually implement the solution, right? So I think even with AI and machine learning, it's still like sort of garbage in, garbage out potential. Um, so, and with all the biases that we have in our data. So we need to think about that clearly. And who needs to buy in and sort of sign off on this, you know, in your health system? Because um, nothing exists in a vacuum, right? Um, you're probably going to have to leverage your EHR, um, and you're going to need all the approvals um, for this. Um, and I think it's especially challenging to think about this in the regulatory uh, framework that we live in. Um, finally, thinking about metrics, how would you measure your success in the project, and then go about sort of using um, your quality improvement process to change the process when it's needed. And then finally, who benefits the most from this, right? So it's the patients, is it the clinicians, and who, you know, what's the collateral damage, and who is the most, um, the most burden? Um, so let's see. I think in the interest of time, we'll just move on to innovation. Um, so again, um, let's think about the questions we just posed, right? So defining the problem. So problem with boarding. Patients who are needing to be admitted to the inpatient setting spend an appropriate, inappropriate amount of time in the ED waiting for that inpatient bed, right? So you're already done uh, working up the patient, you know, getting the patient stabilized. They're ready to get out of your emergency department. So that, that's the problem. So that's where we're starting with. What are the effects of the problem? Um, sort of that, uh, the complications. So now there's increased length of stay for ED patients, not just that patient, but other patients who are waiting to be seen. Um, there's ED patient care potentially happening in hallway beds. How many people have that problem? Like we eliminated hallway care during the COVID era. We haven't gone back, but I'm very skeptical this is gonna work in the long run. Um, so how do we address the problem? So it's important that you target the appropriate intervention. So you really wanna target your intervention to addressing the problem. Like you don't wanna come up with a fancy solution and then try to figure out which problem it's gonna solve, right? So we're starting with the problem here. Um, and then some considerations might be, what is the scope of your project? Like what's in and out of scope? Um, identifying, um, uh, patients who require inpatient level care and determining who could safely, you know, be placed um, boarding in units or, you know, now with everything coming on with hospital at home, is that an option? Um, and then again, who's going to buy it? Who needs to buy into this besides, you know, besides the champion and potentially your chair? Who else in the system needs to sign off on that? So um, really, I'm just going to talk briefly because I know we don't have a lot of time about the user-centered design process, which I think is really important, not just for this, but any quality improvement or um, innovative work you're trying to do. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of that, some of that mindset. Um, so human-centered design, has everybody heard of that? Yeah, so anybody not heard of it? Okay, so we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about what it is. So it provides a framework for innovation. And so the point is here you're designing with the end user in mind, right? So if the end user is emergency physicians, then you're gonna design uh, your process uh, to that end. So you're gonna need to do a lot of talking and assessing from your, um, from your end users. And the problem solving approach will incorporate the users throughout the entire design process. So this could be for a process or pathway or a product. Um, so maybe your product here is the machine learning you know, algorithm that you're gonna implement. You wanna also ensure that your solutions are tailored and they suit the need of the person using um, the solution. So that's why we think always problem based rather than, you know, I think we often in the ED we're problem solvers, we jump to solutionizing right away, but you don't wanna do that in this process. You really wanna spend the time at the outset to figure out what the problem is and then think about 
you know, design something that can help solve that solution. And finally, we really just want to focus on people. We want to focus on the people with the problem um, and the underlying cause, but not actually on the problem itself. So, um, folk, you know, so that's the, the whole purpose of this. So I'll give you a framework to kind of think of that. So four phases. The first phase is inspiration. So this is where you're engaging with your end user, your target audience, and you really want to do some customer discovery and figure out what are their pain points? What is the main issue that they're trying to solve? Um, you want to fully research that audience. Now, I guess we have an advantage being an ED. We kind of know. But you really want to talk to all the people. Um, and this leads to, like, empathy in the process. So you're basically empathizing um, with your audience. Phase two is the ideation phase. So this is the brainstorming phase. So you're going to imagine all the ways that you could potentially address this issue and the needs could, could be solved. So you still haven't come to a solution. You're imagining all the possibilities. So you're still avoiding that solutionizing, like, right away. The goal is realistic and human-centered solution. And again, the tools that you're going to use here include empathy, and there's things called customer journey maps I don't have time to go into, but um, you can look up. So you want to use this process. Finally, in phase three is where you develop the prototype and you do user testing. So you kind of create a prototype design um, of what you're going to do, and then you start to test it. So maybe for your machine learning tool, you're going to start to actually pilot it and see how it works or doesn't work. You know what how users feel about it. Um, does it actually solve the problem? So does it actually solve boarding? So you can kind of pilot test that. Um, and then you want to collect feedback, if it's, especially if it's not working. You want to continue to improve it and um, have your end users help with design. And finally, in the last phase, once you have a design that you think works that is going to solve the problem, you're going to, uh, you're going to test it. Um, at, wait, hold on. This is the same thing, isn't it? What happened here? Sorry. Anyway, basically, once implementation is where you basically have your kind of final product, and then you're um, finding a way to implement into the workflow and look at those outcomes that you set out to um, think about at the outset. And finally, um, just you know, think like an entrepreneur, right? So, think about talking to whoever the end users are. Um, you know, d what is the value proposition for this for this project? What is the market segment? Like, who are you actually trying to d design the process for? Okay, I'm going to pass it to Dev for technical considerations. Hello, I'm Dev. I work with Christian at Stanford. Uh, it's nice to see everybody here. So one thing I'm going to talk about is I work on a team that uh, has, has two sides of this team. So, so think of it like a university side and like a StanfordHealthcare.org side. So university, you know, Department of Emergency Medicine, Department of Computer Science, Stanford Healthcare IT at StanfordHealthcare.edu. They're like data scientists and data engineers and SQL people hired by the hospital to do hospital IT stuff. So most important to know when you start doing some of this work is what models are already available. You may already have the solution built on the IT side. You just never talk to them and you just don't know what's going on on that side. And they may just have something that's out of the box ready for you to use. Now, if that's not the case, are you going to have to build your own or outsource, get a third party or startup to come do it for you? Now, at Stanford, we obviously like to build our own. Obviously, we, we try to just partner with Department of Computer Science to do this. What happens with that is you end up with a model and, uh, that you've designed off a data set that is uh, that, that, that some master's or PhD student has cooked up for you that sits on a Linux server somewhere um, and that's giving you uh, some predictions and you're trying to deliver care using these predictions. That in an implementation phase is rather unethical because you are essentially depending on you're essentially putting the lives of your patients and your out the outcomes of your patients on the hands of like a graduate student who may like may be out of there in like a couple of months, or a PhD student who may move on to another project and is living on some like Linux box somewhere in their lab. Now you want to move that to enterprise architecture, which means that most hospitals in the country are running enterprise IT off the cloud. So Azure, AWS, uh, Salesforce Health Cloud. They have moved all of their services onto the cloud. The other thing that happens is your students are eventually going to graduate, you know, especially with these complex uh, algorithms, they're deep neural net models. They're gonna move on to other things, they're probably gonna move on to industry, pays, pays them a lot better. Uh, somebody needs to manage that. And so the transition from, this is a research project, but I'd like to take this to implementation, as in move it to the enterprise enterprise level architecture and assign a data scientist who's hopefully is paid for by the hospital and not by the department or school of medicine is not a trivial task and t may take upwards of nine to 12 months. 
Um, it's, not, it's not as simple as like taking a USB stick from your lab and like, you know, walking over to the hospital and plugging it in. It's far more complicated than that because you have to make sure these processes don't break down because they're ultimately affecting care delivery and like liability and malpractices on the line. So a lot of technical and legal considerations here. Now, the, uh, one thing I, I'm really emphasizing here is this data scientist or this team that manages this model that's deployed in the healthcare setting, it is great if they are actually hired and um, live on the hospital side because that means they're part of the hospital IT team. They have access to resources in the hospital and you don't have to jump through hoops. Like you may have a university ID and a hospital ID. Well, guess what? They already have a hospital ID. So they're ready to go. They have all the badges and everything. And if they don't have access to data, they probably know somebody who can give them instant access. They probably work within that team for other projects. So it's great for them to live on the hospital side. This is what they do. They're affecting care delivery on the hospital side. Let them live there. They do not need to live on the University Computer Science Department of Emergency Medicine side. Um, and so they can answer questions like, when, how, how fast is this data refreshed? That's important, right, for, for example, for a sepsis model. Can it get to the workflow in time? So if you need, you need a model prediction by like 6 a.m., you, you need to have that data squared away by 4, or at least well before then. Is that even possible? So in some places, your data lake that all the healthcare data is eventually stored and is queryable at a, a really fast um, uh, uh, like a interval, that gets updated every 24 hours, maybe at one or two in the morning. But if you need a prediction at midnight, depending on data that comes in two hours later for something that happened nine hours ago, this is, it's not gonna work out for you. So you're gonna have to know all of these details and design the workflow uh, that makes sense. All right, and finally, you have another, another benefit to having a hospital employee do this is they can monitor the model statistically and they can also help pull the data to monitor the patient outcome. So that's also important. So what's happening to my positive predictive value and my negative predictive value and what's happening to these patients? Are patients still being ben benefited? Are different racial and ethnic subgroups still being benefited? And more importantly, you should just assume every model you deploy out there is going to expire at some point and that it's just gonna get worse and think about an expiration date. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll describe a little bit of kind of what Stanford's preliminary solution to this. We have two teams well integrated that meet for four or five hours every Tuesday and on one side of the team is School of Medicine Department of Computer Science, Department of Biomedical Informatics, and the clinical divisions, uh, whoever needs to be there. And on the other side is at Stanford Healthcare IT Org. And they're all in one room on Tuesdays from noon to 5 p.m. And we talk about how we're going to deploy projects, which projects we're going to deploy, what the difficulty is. And so we, we talk about every prospective project that comes through, and we analyze the clinical workflow, the ethical considerations, and the financial considerations first of every single project that comes through. And then the ones get, that get greenlit move on to another phase where we talk about the, you know, if we need to revamp the model, rebuild the model, move into the enterprise architecture, um, and uh, figure out what the refresh rate is and how we're gonna back integrate it into the clinical workflow. Now, once it's deployed, it moves on to a monitoring team that is tasked with making sure the statistics and the patient outcomes are still the same. Now, the reason we still, we don't do a handoff, so to speak, between School of Medicine and, and StanfordHealthcareIT.org, there are elements that hospital IT is gonna be unable to do and may come back to the university folks. For example, the Attorney General of California man, is going to mandate that every AI algorithm that is running within a healthcare organization, they would like to know what's running and how it affects different subgroups of the populations that your health system is treating. That may, be, may not be something that you know, Stanford Healthcare IT organization is able to answer, and they may need to go back to the Department of Computer Science for assistance. So we keep everybody in the same room, we go back and forth, but there's no, there's no such thing as, I'm done with this, I hand you off to this next team, and we move on from there. Stakeholders, so stakeholders are really important. 
I'm gonna list four important stakeholders, and if those four people are on your team, I think your project will go really well. Chief Information Officer, Chief Medical Information Officer, your Division uh, Operations Lead, and finally, Chief Enterprise Architect. If you have these four people on your team for your project, I think you'll be fine. We have 20 minutes, so I'm just racing through this. <laughs> um, and finally, I'm gonna skip this slide in the interest of time and hand it over to our next speaker. Hey everyone, I'm John, I'm a PGI-1 at Northwestern. Uh, before I came to medicine, I was a product and project manager in digital health, so that's kind of my approach or perspective when thinking about AI implementations. Um, the key to success in any AI implementation is considering principles of project management that include things like monitoring, accountability, and quality improvement, and making sure that those principles are directly aligned with the overall goal of the project itself. Uh, when you start thinking about monitoring, organizations first need to establish and understand their KPIs, or key performance indicators. Ideally, these are measurements that are tied to the direct um, goal of the project itself. So in, the, in Larissa's example, measuring the actual reduction in boarding time for patients. But KPIs also need to include metrics that are related to things like end user experience, as well as the ethics and equity of that AI tool that's being deployed. Most organizations are gonna rely on some sort of a business analysis or business intelligence platform like Power BI or Tableau to visually represent these KPIs in a way that's user friendly. But that brings into question the topic of accountability. Who's monitoring the KPIs? Who intervenes based off that data? And who's responsible for ensuring the quality of the output as well as continuously improving both the model and the KPIs themselves? Most groups, if you look at who's actually running these, if you, if you look at organizations that rely only on folks from the IT or corporate or administrative side, tend to create situations where project goals are misaligned to meet primarily business or financial needs. On the other hand, you have some organizations where these groups are managed only by the clinical experts, and this creates problems where the goals are misaligned to meet only the clinical outcomes or looking at only at the clinical outcomes while not considering the very real financial or operational constraints that, that exist. So the point being, for this to be successful, this group needs to incorporate stakeholders, both from the corporate IT and administrative side, as well as the clinician experts, the physicians on the ground, who are actually deploying the tool. Uh, organizations that, that don't em employ that tactic or that strategy tend to find that their projects either fail or are only successful in the very short term. I think we're out of time. We'll open up to questions, obviously, versus just running out the door to go get cocktails. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Comments, anything? Oh, I think we're going to Cheyenne first. Yeah, so um, the Stanford uses the Epic cloud computing platform, or if they have their own cloud service for me. Yes, that's a good question. We do have that. Uh, are you talking about cognitive compute? Yeah, so we do have that turned on, but we're not using it to uh, affect care delivery at the moment. And there are no uh, concrete plans to do so. So I think it's turned on just, just, for, like just for funsies. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, yeah, we, we mostly build our own. And we use Azure and not AWS. Let's see. We'll go over in the front here first, and then follow up with you in the back corner. Did you have a question, so? There was an article about whether or not that might be a use case. Um, so some people are writing about various use I cases. I was just wondering if that was a program that and it's being used by by a less competent coded code by using the AI to tell the code and then use it. I've heard about it, but I was wondering if this was the name of the program. I don't know if there's the Dev could also speak to this too. I don't know of any actively available uh, GPT using coding systems like available to the market. I know that that is a definitely a use case that people are exploring to interpret what you did in your notes, but. Yeah, so Ch Chat GPT can help debug your code and help write preliminary like code structures for you that you can fill in with your own variables and file names. Yeah. Back corner. I just had a question. So as this as this area 
area in Japan. Yes. There's more, can you talk a little bit about importing or exporting the mature model to other systems or how companies collaborate or talk about collaborating and to in increase your initial testing sample or no, I, I, are there mm. talks about maybe you or something like that to create a more, uh, to expedite the maturation model or There's definitely, I'll, I'll also shuttle this over to Dev as well, there's definitely talk around elements of like federated learning and the ability to train at different sites <laughs> and across institutions, which I think is probably the future of this instead of trying to get everyone's data into one database. Um, in terms of current uh, re, like, you know, retraining models on external data. I don't, I, we're not involved in any that I know of, but you can speak to that more. Yeah, so nobody's really doing that right now on like any meaningful scale. What, the problem that you're gonna run into is something called a domain adaptation problem, is when you, when you take a model that's trained on Palo Alto and horseback riders that we see <laughs> in the peninsula, and then and you move- And bicycles. And bicycles, <laughs> and then you move it to in an inner city uh, population, your models are gonna perform really poorly. They mo often need to be trained up. However, I would say with the advent of foundation models, like some of the domain adaptation problems are gonna go away due to something called few shot or zero shot learning. We can talk about that separately. I'm sure there's a million different ways you could actually slice that question too. It really depends on what your model is trying to do or what problem you're trying to solve, how uh, much of what you're already recruiting and is already available to you can be used versus do you have to recruit new information or some people in our department are working on wearable devices that people have at home and they have to then request it from like Apple Health Kit. And it really depends um, what your question is, but for any of those, the different institutions obviously have different availability to both store and pull and request information from cell phones. Stanford does a lot of work with the health, their own Stanford Health Kit too, which if you want to have a healthcare app, they'll start recruiting the data, keep it safe and secure for you. So depending on what your question is um, and what you're trying to solve, there's different levels of intensity in that uh, getting access to the data you want. And that's a whole data scientist's uh, life of the 80% of your time, you know, cleaning your data and refining it before using it in the model in the first place, but um, that is a huge part of the pipeline for sure. Yeah, one thing, one thing I wanna chime in, 10 words. The model building part that everybody is like really excited about, oh, we're gonna use a neural net, logistic regression, whatever it is, consider that to be seven to 9% of the overall problem of going from idea to downstream deployment. It's less than 10%. And that has not, that number has not budged for years. Um, so integrating it is, is quite difficult. Yeah. Cool. All right, well, we'll be up here. Thank you guys very much for coming. Appreciate it. Was great.